whose turn is it? I'll I'll nominate you, Alistair. Really? <laughs> I thought it was my turn to nominate you. You're the whole song, it's your meeting. Yeah, all right, well, go on then. Okay. So, so we'd like to second yeah, so it. So so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, second it. Thank you. Anybody against that, apart from myself? <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, I'm deeply honoured. Right. Um, obviously, welcome to this uh, Jack meeting. Um, um, and uh, have we any apologies, Nina, or anybody else? Yeah, we've got apologies from Councillor Caleb Tomlinson. OK. Right, thank you for that. Nobody else got any uh, apologies? No. Um, next item is any declarations of interest. Has anybody got any interest in any particular items they need to declare now? No. OK, that's great. And then the next item is the minutes of the last meeting, which um, should be in your papers that have been circulated. Has um, somebody want to propose those or propose any amendments or comment accordingly? Happy to propose those, Chair. Thank you, Alistair. Anybody want to second those? I'll second those, Alistair. Thank you, Keith. Anybody against those minutes, please speak. I'll do it that way around rather than trying to get people to show support. Anybody has any objections to those minutes, please speak now. Otherwise, we will move on. OK, that's taken as um, as fine. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, the next item of um, on the agenda. Excuse me a second while I'm looking between two machines is um, the local plan update um, and we've got an update who's taking us through this item please i am chair carolyn all right carolyn fire away thank you okay um thanks everybody so it's a while since we've had a meeting um so just giving you an update on, on what we've been doing over the last few months so as you're aware, the issues and options consultation ran um, until the 14th of February this year. Um, we received just over 1,600 um, stakeholders responses to that, which equated to um, actually about 25,000 responses to the questions, which was really good. Um, through that, the significant number of responses as, as expected were um, in relation to the sites with approximately around 3,000 of those responses just specifically on the sites. We did um, also get a lot of responses in regards to the approach to housing allocations, where they should be put and the type of numbers that we should be planning for, and also the types of homes with specific concern around the need for affordable homes and adaptable homes, um, and especially making sure that the homes that we do build are for those living in the area who require homes rather than providing commuter homes. There was also um, a need for additional employment opportunities identified and high quality employment as well. Um, and there was a request that this type of employment be located near to um, either where people are going to be living, so new developments or planned with sustainable travel in mind so that we can reduce the use and dependence on cars. As with um, you know, historic meetings, the issue um, of education provision across all three areas has been raised and there is concern that this is um, insufficient to meet current population requirements and therefore increasing population due to new housing. So that's something that is of real concern to everybody. Again, local infrastructure is also something that was raised as an issue and something that we will be addressing. We have produced as a, an outcomes report on this and it has been with the home teams for sign off. Um, and I'm hoping that that now should be in a position to send to everybody, probably for the next local plan working group rounds and maybe for approval at the next JAC. Um, on the back of the consultation as well, we also did a youth questionnaire, if you recall, and that was really successful. We had around 600 responses from 11 to 21 year olds, mainly high school, but a few older ones as well. And um, Preston, um, you win the trophy for the most responders there. So we do need to probably engage a bit better of our schools and colleges in South Ribble and Chorley going forward. And that's something that we've highlighted as an action from this. 
the youth were most concerned with access to a range of activities, both indoor and outdoor, and having safe environments for themselves to travel around in, as well as good access to higher education and further education. And this latter point was what was raised as a reason as to why people may leave the area. Um, but there was also quite a keenness in apprenticeship and awareness of that. So that's something that we can look to promote through the local plan. Again, they were generally concerned with issues around the wider environment and how we make better use of that and also how to protect it for future generations. Um, the next um, aspect of that consultation was our call for sites. And if you recall, we're up to our third call for sites now. So as part of this, um, we received um, 209 submissions. And of those, 73 were completely new submissions. The rest of them had already been submitted in some form or another. Of those new submissions, 36 were in Chorley, 17 in Preston and 20 in South Ribble. So we're moving forward to start assessing those and, and that's in line with our strategic housing, employment, land and availability assessment. And as part of this consultation, um, there was feedback on that approach to say that we needed to make some changes to our current Sheila, as we call it, to make sure that we're in line with national policy. And the specific changes that were requested to that were to bring back into consideration sites lying partially within protected areas, flood zones, sites in open countryside and areas of other open countryside, protected open land and wholly brownfield sites in the green belt. So those are changes that we will be making and will therefore mean that we'll have additional sites that we'll look at through this initial Sheila approach. But we are, it's a flexible approach that we can take to this so we can include those sites at this time. So following um, the review of these initial sites, we will and hopefully be in a position to see where we are in relation to have we got sufficient land for employment, housing, leisure, et cetera. But I'll say that will probably be into next year now because we are slightly behind where we wanted to be on that. Um, other pieces of work that we're doing um, is a strategic flood risk assessment. Um, and that is a presentation later on this evening, but that is a big piece of evidence work that has been ongoing throughout uh, in the last few months. And we're currently working with the home teams to review the findings of the consultants. One thing to note on the strategic flood risk assessment is all the sites that were submitted for call for sites one, two and three have been included in this work. So although we know that we will not take and the majority of those sites forward, we felt at this time it didn't cost us extra money to put that assessment through. So we might want to look at those sites and it gives us extra justification for those that we do need to rule out later on in the process. Um, the Iceni housing study is something that we highlighted as needing to be updated. But I say the planning white paper is something that we have been responding to as individual councils and has a direct impact on what we will then do through that housing study. So the housing study update will need to take account of the change in economic and growth aspirations as a result of what we're currently still going through through COVID, but it will also need to take account of any changes proposed as part of the standard method. And until the consultation responses are out on the planning white paper, it's probably not pertinent to do those updates at this time. There is also a housing needs study that's being done between Preston and Chorley councils. South Ribbles had already undertaken a similar study in 2019 and Preston are leading on the commissioning of this work and we are hoping to commission that before the end of the year. Central Lanks Transport Master Plan is still continuing through county. Um, they've given us the initial stage, which is basically the baseline evidence. Um, we will then start feeding the sites through that, that we've start looked at assessing to see what implications those have on infrastructure needs going forward. Um, we have still not progressed work on climate and renewable energy, and that was mainly because we had been waiting for a study um, which was being commissioned by the county. However, due to the pandemic, they didn't get that work um, released in time and as such, there's been delays there. So we are still waiting for the county to come back to us as to when they are likely to undertake that study because it will have direct implications for what we do. But if it doesn't fit within our timeline, then we have had discussions about taking that forward independently and we have got a, a significant budget aligned for that. So we should get some useful work to feed in because it is a key priority for all three councils. The habitats regulation assessment is progressing, but again, we had delayed cons um, getting the consultants on board, mainly because we were trying to find out what would happen with the planning white paper, but we are progressing with the plan and we do need those consultants on board. 
Um, the initial stage of that where it literally just looks at the sites that need to be considered and then it will look at screening in or out um, any of the site suggestions based on whether they will have a significant effect and an appropriate assessment is needed. But let's say we're just at the commissioning stage of that, so further updates will come forward. And similarly with local plan viability, we are still looking to consult, um, get consultants in to do that work. But procurement of that only needs to start once we've done the initial site work, otherwise we've got consultants sat waiting and charging us money when, when we haven't got anything to give them. So that work will commissioned in the new year now. Um, the development scheme was approved by all councils um, at the beginning of the year. Obviously, we haven't revised that timetable to take um, account of anything to do with COVID or to take account of any changes proposed through the planning white paper. But as it stands, we are still proposing to deliver the local plan as a local plan because there is no timescales yet released by government to indicate when they expect transitional arrangements to come forward for revisions of how local plans will be developed. And therefore, it is pertinent that we do get a local plan forward to ensure that we have a housing supply um, guaranteed across the three council areas. So at the moment, we are still aiming for a 2023 adoption date. Due to cooperate discussions still ongoing and the most recent one I have had is being with Stagecoach and that's about how they can improve bus services across the area, which I know a number of members will be, will be keen to do and they are very keen to engage directly within the local plan to ensure that any future large scale developments in particular that we, we identify um, take account of the need to provide an efficient bus service and how they can plan this an early stage. That, that's my update share, thank you. Thank you, Carolyn. Lots in there. Um, Councillor Michael Green, I've got first. Thanks, Chairman. Um, can, I, can I thank Carolyn for that, for that update, which is very helpful. Um, I was particularly asked to speak on, on a couple of items. So, so with regard to, to young people being cons consulted, I think that's a, a real positive that we've got some, some responses from young people um, with regard to plans moving forwards. Uh, however, they've, they've highlighted the issue of importance of access to further and higher education. Um, and they don't feel there's enough for them in this area. But how can we address that? Because we already have um, excellent further education in terms of the colleges which are in the central Lancashire area. Um, and in terms of universities, obviously we've got UQAM that sits right, right at, at the heart of central Lancashire. But beyond that, across Lancashire, we have another three universities currently. And with a fourth one to open, open a, a unit uh, in the not too distant future. Uh, so, so we are well provided in, in terms of universities and, and particularly I think we, we have the highest number of STEM graduates for, for an example um, anywhere in the country um, in Lancashire. So there's a lot that is being done but I don't know how we can work more effectively potentially with further and higher education institutions to actually take that forward and address that concern um, from young people. So, so that's one point Chairman. The other point I, I wish to speak on was with, with regard to this uh, study on climate change. Um, which Caroline said that hasn't been commissioned. As far as I'm aware, it wasn't the County Council that was commissioning that. I think that came out as, as on the back of work that's been done on the Greater Lancashire Plan. And Ch Chairman, you might be aware, I think that's been done via the Lancashire leaders. Now, whether or not they've asked the County Council to, to in turn commission it, I, I don't know. But if that's something that the County Council needs to be doing something on, I'll make sure that moves forward. So, so if we can have some clarification on that. Obviously, that study is a key piece of work moving forward to allow us to, to address the important issue of climate change. Thank you. Um, thank you. I'm not sure anybody on the call knows who actually, where that work originated. I know it has been discussed within Lancashire leaders as part of the, the add-ons. On Go on, Carolyn, yeah. Um, so on the, um, great, are you correct? It's part of the work that was done for the Great Lancashire Plan, but county were leading on the commissioning of that. And Emma Prido had been um, our contact on updates as to how that was progressing. And she did say, literally, they just ran out of time for commissioning it, but they are the lead. Although it's been done on behalf of the authority, the county are leading on that. And it was Andrew Mullaney who alerted me to the fact that that study was being undertaken. Um, so it is a county led, but it is correct for the Greater Lancashire yeah. Plan. And on the education side, I can and I can add some comments on there. I mean, we you know I, 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 if this was raised at other meetings have been at for the local plan the working groups. And yeah, I mean, you plan is one that's that's raised up. I think that the, if you look at the where the responses came from, the majority of responses were from students in Preston. So it may be that within the part of Preston they live, kids tend to look what's in their immediate area. They might not necessarily think what's wider because they they don't tend to perhaps look that way. So it's perhaps when we go forward, we can actually say, 
next time are you aware of the following colleges in your area and which ones are you are you interested in, in studying at them so we can name Runshaw we can name um what it was Cardinal Newman has it changed its name yet I'm not sure if it's changing those are saints um so the, the things like that and obviously we are aware that we have prestigious universities um on our doorstep as well like Lancaster so it may be a case of the type of studies that people want or they, they see the big cities whether the Preston hasn't got that kudos for them but actually the university is doing that and the campus is being improved and we have had um, a meeting with UConn about how we can interact with them as well but I think it's when we go forward next time it gives us an idea of how to probably phrase our questions a bit better and, and perhaps ask them what it is specifically they need. Okay, thank you. Um, and I'm sure, Councillor Green, if you want to raise that with Emma bit over, I'll also raise it through the uh, Lancashire Leaders Working yeah. Group, which uh, formed out to that as well. That'd be great. Yeah, we'll, we'll do, Chairman. Thanks, thank Colin, for the response. Okay, uh, I've got Councillor Barry Yates first and then Councillor Alistair Morewood after that. Right, thank you, Chairman. I think it'd be very helpful um, if the housing need, I see that South Ribble has done this, uh, that Preston and Chorley could, um, when they've completed theirs, if we could have a copy where the housing need is uh, in, in the boroughs, it would be very helpful for, the, for, uh, for me as a county councillor. Noted, and I think that will be shared. He says, looking for officers, yep, that will be shared in due course, Barry, yep, fine. Councillor Alistair Morewood. Thank you, Chase. Just to come back on on the discussion on education, um, absolutely was yeah was surprised at, uh, at what's being said that uh, student uh, young people um, saw a lack of um, sort of FE and HE, uh, and and it's been partly answered by Carolyn. I mean, as you say, uh, we got Runshaw, one of the top colleges in the. In, in this part of the world, vocational colleges like my school, another top college in this, you've got UCLan, you've got Lancaster and all the rest. So, as you say, perhaps it's because of those students in that area, but it might be worth um, sharing it with the universities and the colleges around and say, do you know, there seems to be a large chunk of people who don't seem to know that you exist. So uh, that, that, that might be worth looking at as well. Thank you. OK, thank you for that. And we will do that, Alistair, I'm sure. And officers will do that and feed that back. Councillor Marty Bowman, I've got next. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, it's just a, a question, really, in relation to paragraphs 16 to 18. It's in relation to the um, uh, revised assessments under Sheila. Um, Paragraph 16 makes a comment and states that following feedback received to the issues and options consultation, there were comments received which suggest that the methodology is not in line with national policy. I just want to ask where those comments have come from and how they've originated and um, uh, and, and dropped into this uh, this thinking now, because obviously that, that potentially has an effect on how we looked at um, sites that were um, submitted under st stages one and two uh, and going back over those sites. So I just wanted to get a bit of a bit of an update on that if possible. Yeah, it was mainly, um, as you expect, a lot of the house builders, but also um, Homes England. And um, it was just a, a recognise that actually to be in line with national policy, we should actually be including those at this stage. So it's something like a policy on rather than a policy off approach in, in, in that reflect. So we were not including sites that are wholly in the green belt and, and just there's no there's been no development there. We will be looking at them and it just allows us to rule those sites in or else at this stage before we then consider a, a, a larger scale review of, of land that we perhaps might not want to be considering at this stage. So it gives us an opportunity to see with these additional options now, whether that gives us sufficient land capable of meeting our future requirements before considering the need for um, a wider strategic review of the green belt and other open land. And just to come back on that chair, thanks Carolyn, that's really good. Um, it's and um, with regards to the hierarchical approach that we're taking on assessing all the sites, would you say that that, that still would fall quite a long way down the hierarchy? And if we do satisfy our requirements of sites without um, dipping our toe into, should we say, the partial uh, protected land sites, is, is that a fair assessment or or would they just get um, kind of uh, measured or, or, or judged on, on their own merits, every one of them? 
So the methodology is quite detailed if you look at it, and there's a lot of things that we need to look at and take account of. And they will also include um, how easy the sites are to access, for instance, whether the utilities can be connected to those sites and um, whether we have got other constraints close by that would impact them, which would might affect the suitability. So there the will be the whole raft of things that, that can affect the suitability of a site. So at the moment, these sites will all be considered at the same level, but okay. that some sites will be considered more suitable than others at the end of that process. And we will take those ones that rank highest. So there may be, for instance, parts of these sites that might be affected by flood risk. We're only, we're only getting part way through that approach, or there may be some, um, ecological value or biodiversity issues on those sites that need to be addressed which will rate sites up or rate sites down mm -hmm. okay, okay. yeah yeah thank you for that yeah okay any other questions on that report i can't see any hands up speak now or um, we'll move on thank you that's that item completed um and um i'm sure we'll come back to that another day um Item seven is the, the next paper is planning for the future. Um, the planning white paper consultation update. Um, who's taking us through this paper, please? It's my name on that <coughs> chair, so I'll take you Congratulations, through Congratulations, Chris. <laughs> Thank you very much. By the way. So, yeah, thanks, Chair. So, I mean, th this is very much a case of um, Closing the stable door after the horse has bolted, uh, given that the consultation's closed. Uh, but I think we, we we thought it was important to be able to uh, brief uh, members of the Joint Advisory Committee on the proposals in the white paper, um, given that they are going to have, uh, if implemented, a significant uh, impact on how we take the Central Lancashire Local Plan forward. Um, so the, the consultation closed on the 29th of October. Um, and as members will be aware, the white paper um, emphasised the need for a once in a generation change uh, to the planning system, uh, highlighting the fact that the government believed the, the system to be too complex, um, doesn't deliver enough new homes uh, and suffers from a loss of public trust uh, and delays development in effect. Um, so the new, the, but the new system is proposed to continue to adopt a plan led approach. Uh, if we do deem the current one a plan-led approach, indeed, uh, but it is proposed to continue that. Um, and I, I, I'm, I'm the report sets out uh, edited highlights. Yeah, sorry, you can come in. I've turned camera off because I can't do any. I can't get in it. So, <laughs> and BT Hub Six, yeah. So I need to Could I just ask members who to mute, please? Yeah. Who aren't muted? Okay, carry so on. Okay, thanks, Chair. So okay, capital P. Yeah, the proposals, uh, are, I mean, there's 20, 26 or so proposals in the white paper. Um, I'm not proposing to run through all of those. The report does uh, show some of those. Uh, I mean, the key one for us uh, uh, in terms of plan making is the, the, the proposal to, to, to simplify the role of local plans, uh, to identify three types of land, uh, growth areas, uh, which will be areas subject to substantial levels of growth, renewal areas, um, which could be suitable for development um, and could cover, for example, existing built up areas uh, and so on and so forth, or pro and protected areas, uh, which we would read between the lines as being what, you know, our green belt, our open countryside, our AOMBs, our conservation areas and so on and so forth. Um, that's a massive change to what we're what we're used to right now. Uh, it is, as many people have suggested, a type of zoning. Even though the word zoning doesn't appear once uh, in the planning white paper, it clearly is uh, that 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 type of approach. Um, or, you know, there is a proposal in the white paper for a lot of generic development management policies to be included in that in in national. Uh, policy, so we wouldn't have to repeat them in local policy in an, it, local plans in an attempt to shrink down the the length of local plans. Um, a key proposal uh, is the introduction of a binding housing requirement. Uh, some members will be aware that currently the national planning policy framework proposes the standard methodology for us to calculate our lo local housing need. That's not our binding housing requirement. That's supposed to be a minimum. Uh, housing need figure, which we are to work from. 
Um, now that, that, that the government are now proposing in the in the white paper that the new planning system will have a binding uh, top-down housing requirement placed on local authorities. Uh, they are saying that that will not just be a purely formulaic approach and that it will take account of constraints in various local authorities, which of course it needs to, uh, to for it to have any meaning. Um, you know, there is a, as, as members are aware, there's a significant proportion of green belt in South Ribble and Chorley, not necessarily the case in Preston, um, but it, it's, it's, it's clear that the current formulaic approach pr provides figures, certainly in Chorley, um, that aren't really representative of, of land constraints and actual physical ability to release land for housing. Uh, it's important to add that the proposals do suggest that there'll continue to be uh, scope for local authorities to combine um, housing figures uh, and redistribute those as we have been trying to in central Lancashire uh, through the memorandum of understanding and we'll uh, I'll continue to, to, to do that through the local plan process. Um, so I'll link back to the, the, the proposals for growth, renewal and protected areas, the government are suggesting that there will be simplified route to planning permission uh, based on what the allocation is in the local plan. The headline there being that uh, sites identified as growth areas uh, in the local plan uh, will will have automatic outline type planning permission granted uh, upon um, their allocation in the local plan, which will mean that a further outline planning permission wouldn't be required and only detailed uh, planning permission would be required. I, I think it's fair to say that the white paper doesn't suggest exactly what that outline type planning application planning permission would look like. It perhaps wouldn't be as detailed as what our current outline planning application system is. It may be more aligned with the permission in principle approach, but nevertheless, that's a, a, a huge change. Um, it's especially uh, even more uh, uh, highlighted as a huge change uh, when we take into account the fact that the white paper also suggests that all detailed uh, decisions uh, that are taken uh, by a council will be will be done by del will be delegated to officers. Uh, and I think certainly from our view in Preston, uh, then that would appear to be the case that if you identify an area as a growth area, for example, in Preston, not a site such as Northwest Preston, um, given it would be granted an outline planning permission uh, by allocation, all future detailed planning applications that are submitted to the council will actually be determined under delegated powers and wouldn't need to, to, to go to planning committee. Um, now, the, the, the thought of that is quite staggering uh, from our point of view uh, at, at Preston City Council, and that, that's, the, that's the nature of the response that we've provided to the white paper in that regard. Uh, so just quickly going through the, the streamlined local planning process, as well as uh, simplifying to growth, renewal and protection areas, uh, the government are proposing uh, that there would be uh, five stages in the production of a local plan um, and that these stages cumulatively would only add up to 30 months in total. Again, it's a significant departure from how we are currently operate in the in the plan making world where local plans can take on average up to five years uh, to produce this would cut that in half um, I think it's it's safe to say that what they're suggesting the method which they'll do that is to reduce the amount of public consultation um, which uh, is, is 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 clearly uh, uh, you know a contentious approach um, and they are suggesting that LPAs who fail to get a plan in place within the 30 months from this legislation being passed may face government intervention. Um, Naval plans will continue to play a role uh, in our planning system, although it's not clear exactly what that role will be. The detail isn't there in the white paper. Um, there are also a, a number of changes uh, suggested with regards to design um, and the implementation of locally produced design codes. Um, which I think it's fair to say are very resource intensive uh, tasks to try and produce those. They are in a way all encompassing and don't necessarily uh, just cover you know, pure design matters. They can cover a whole raft uh, of things uh, and that that would have, if this proposal does come forward, it would obviously have serious implications for us from a resource perspective in putting together design codes, whether we do that in-house or we, or, we, or, we, or we get external assistance for that. Um, the, the white paper does cover um, the, the issue of climate change and the um, desire to achieve net zero uh, carbon by 2050. Um, and, but it, it does really kick that into the long grass in that it does suggest that 
um, they will consider uh, ways in which uh, the planning system uh, can explore options for energy efficiency uh, standards beyond 2025. Uh, so there's an absence of detail there, to be fair. Uh, and the, the third main pillar, finally, to the to the to the reform planning system is a is a is a reformed community infrastructure levy approach. Um, what the white paper suggests is that the the role of Section 106 agreements uh, in planning decisions will disappear, and they'll be integrated into a new infrastructure levy. Uh, so drop the C off and make an infrastructure levy. Uh, that's kind of the proposal here. Um, it's suggested that this will be based on a national uh, level, a national uh, value-based minimum threshold level. Um, now that that's, uh, you know, obviously in central Lancashire, we, we have set all this very locally. Um, and I think it's fair to say that the SIL approach has been highly successful uh, in in achieving um, the delivery of community infrastructure and receipts from uh, development proposals that have come forward since its inception in September 2013. Um, this would be a, a radical change to that really um, and the implement, implementation of a national standard um, which we may well have concerns that if it's too low um, it, it, uh, it, it sells us short, if you will, in terms of helping to deliver infrastructure. And if it's too high, uh, it means that development isn't viable uh, and then wouldn't need to pay infrastructure levy. Um, another key proposal in that reformed infrastructure levy is the fact that delivery of affordable housing on site uh, could, be, could, could be deemed as an in-kind contribution through the infrastructure levy, so they would get a um, a deduction on their infrastructure levy bill for um, delivery of on-site affordable housing. Uh, interestingly, they are suggesting that there may be, that they are looking at more scope uh, for freedom to local authorities and how they spend the infrastructure levy. Uh, members will be aware that currently we have the regulation 123 list or the previous regulation 123 list and now the infrastructure funding statements uh, where we list the infrastructure that community infrastructure levy will be used uh, to pay for in our local authorities. Um, now, you know that that's uh, that that there could be scope for that to be uh, there's some flex in that from government. Uh, they even suggest in the white paper uh, that it could be used uh, to offset reductions in council tax um, if a local authority wanted to to take that option. So they, they the government are clearly looking at a number of possibilities in terms of flexibility um, in that. Um, and the white paper also finishes off by talking a little bit about strengthening enforcement powers uh, for local authorities as well um, and the sanctions that are available to local authorities and how they punish breaches of planning control, um, which is a, a little bit of a strange add on at the end, uh, but nevertheless, it is there in the white paper. Uh, so that's about it from me, Chair. It's a whistle stop tour through the, the white paper and the reforms. There's plenty that I've not been able to to mention, um, but it, it's clear that if these reforms do uh, come to bear in the future, then they will have uh, quite significant implications for us in terms of plan making uh, and how we how we work together jointly in in the coming years. Uh, so thanks, Chair. Thank you, Chris. Uh, very detailed run through there. Um, it's appreciated, and I'm sure that members will have um, considered this. <laughs> In their own councils and their own organisations previously, but I think it's um, it's something that we're going to have to keep an eye on moving forward. Has anybody got any particular questions or points they want to make at this stage or ask uh, Councillor Martin Borman? I've got first. Uh, thanks, Alistair, and um, thanks for that, Chris. It was very helpful. Um, it's just a question generally. Um, we are currently going through obviously our next stage of plan making. And I just wanted to ask the officers what their thoughts on of how much of the work that we're doing at the moment um, would be reflective and be able to be used in the in a, a new form of plan, which um, broadly lines itself in the government white paper um, policy. I just wondered if they can uh, come back on that. They've got a better opinion than I have on it. Do you want me to tackle that one, Chris, or you? Yeah, I mean, I think I'll, I think I'll leave that to Carolyn um, to answer. I think I think the, the bottom line is that we've a lot of work has, has, has been undertaken already by the home teams and specifically the central team. 
Uh, I certainly don't think that we're in a situation where that's abortive work, even if we do transfer to this new style uh, system. But we, will, we we may well have to make some key decisions on how we take things forward from from here. But I'll, I'll, I'll leave Car Carolyn to, to answer much better than I'll be able to. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Chris. So, yeah, I mean, what, what Chris has said is exactly right. We have been focusing on the work over the last few months that would not be considered abortive if the government's plan of getting new plans in place by May 2023 actually comes to fruition, which I can't see it actually in reality because there's too much to get done in the next 12 months for legislation to come forward. But if they did, we've been concentrating initially on the work that wouldn't be abortive, so specifically on the science and the approach to science, because that is still really important. So we do still need to identify areas that we want to take forward. We're also having an emphasis on the design aspect of the local plan, because obviously we do need design. And as Chris pointed out, it, it, it forms a key component of the development management stage and the planning stage. And actually for sites to be allocated in the local plan and to get that outline permission stage, we, we effectively need to have um, design guides in place. So that needs to come through as part of the local plan. So that's something that we think is really important to get in at this stage. So, so at the moment, my team are focusing on that. Um, we, we're still doing stuff on sustainability appraisal because that's something that effectively is removed and a, a, a more simple test on sustainable development, but we're not sure exactly what that comes forward. But actually, we're deciding that until we know, we, we are going to keep going forward as we are on the local plan. So as I say, at the moment, the work has been concentrated on those areas in, 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 the, in the short term, which wouldn't be abortive, but I think that it, it's very, you know, I can't see the, the, the local plan changes coming quickly enough for us to be wasting our, our time at the moment. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thanks, Thanks. Martin, yeah. Uh, yeah, great. Uh, thank you. Okay. Councillor Peter Moss. Thank you, Alistair. Yeah, I, I don't think there's any doubt we have to continue as we are and, and, and continue the great work that's been carried out. And, and um, you know, Chris has outlined um, the changes and, and put together a fantastic response from Preston. Um, he's, he's been able to take out all my effing and jeffing words in, in order to produce an appropriate response to the consultation. Um, I mean, Chris also said that um, the word zoning doesn't appear in, in, the, uh, in, in the government's white paper, neither does the word councillor. I think it's quite relevant actually. Um, and, and I think the, the thing I find most depressing about this is that, is that it, it gives another insight into what this government thinks about, about to local authorities. We're an irritant. We're in the way. We block stuff, and 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 they need to circumvent us. And and I know I'm being political here, but um, I, I think that's uh, I think it's important that it's said. Perhaps it, just for political balance, I can quote um, a, a Conservative Prime Minister who said, "Change, change. Aren't things bad enough as they are?" <laughs> I yeah, echo those sentiments, Peter. Um, I will ask officers to respond to that unless they really really want to. Um, I've got Councillor John Potter first and then Jonathan Node. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, just kind of reiterating some of the points. This is so bad, this report, and it's so poor in its design that it has no chance of actually becoming law at all. And so, we, like uh, others have said, we absolutely have to carry on with our existing strategies because this thing is so toxic, it will be dropped. There's no way this is actually going to come into force. Um, I mean, it's fine that we're looking into it and we've done the due diligence and Chris Blackburn has his usual brilliant self, but we shouldn't, be, I mean, the, the, the political toxicity of this is massive. So it will not become law, but, uh, and we should absolutely continue our work on things like local plans and other things that are actually going to happen. Okay, thank you for that. Jonathan, did you want to come in as well? Yeah, th thanks, thanks, Chair. It's just going back to the the implications point for our, our local plan. That the advice that's coming out of government at the moment is, is very firmly: if you're working on a local plan, that, then continue um, to do so. Don't don't put the brakes on. But ha having said that, it it is very difficult because um, we don't want to be doing abortive work. We don't want to be in a position where we have to go back a stage um, or, or anything anything like that. But I, I think the overriding message coming from from government is is to continue with local plan work um, as, as best you can. And I think key to any of this will, will be will be transitional arrangements. Um, that's certainly something we, we've raised at South Ribble in our, our response to the consultation is 
is that if you're going to do this, then the transitional arrangements need to be really clear and, and helpful for authorities like like ourselves who, who are who are in the process of, of producing the new local plan. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you for that, uh, Jonathan. That's great. Um, I have no other hands up at the minute. I am I'm assuming that each council's response has been circulated to the other councils, um, and I would hope that that is the case, and also that then that can be circulated to members, both on on this group and our individual local working plan uh, working plan groups or whatever um, back at the ranches. That would be useful as well, just to understand if others are saying anything different at all, or if it's a fairly consistent approach, which I am. From hearing what I'm hearing, I'm suggesting it might well be, but uh, let's see where it goes. OK, we're asked to note that report, I think. Um, um, uh, and that's all we're asked to do on that particular item. Um, the next item is the my screen's just gone off. Somebody help me out. What's next? The central central. Rail. Yeah, is that you, Alison? Are you doing that report? Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, we engaged consultants WSP to look into the rail improvement options on the Preston to Ulbskirk line, the Southport to Wigan line and the Preston to Wigan line. It was a high level study reviewing past work on what had been happening on those lines, looking at what factors may have changed since then and which could justify investment required to deliver improvements to junctions, the reopening of stations or the delivery of new stations. The, the main focus of the study was look, to look at, um, and that's why West Lanks were included, at how improvements could be delivered in Bursco to better connect the two lines which pass through this area, as well as options for the reopening of Midge Hall Station in South Ribble and Coppel in Chorley. Um, additional station options were also considered um, in South Ribble and Chorley, and tram options were also discussed by the consultants, and they are presented in the final report, which is attached at Appendix 1. The study findings, um, a SWOT analysis was undertaken of the current network and looked at options for improving the existing rolling stock, greener, cleaner trains, improving the current routes offered and potential for reopening stations or completely new stations. Um, the new stations that were looked at and were proposed um, are identified to reduce gaps between existing stopping points and also could help to open land for redevelopment. The station locations proposed um, also may have potential for park and ride sites. So these were Bursco Junction connecting uh, to connect Preston and Ormskirk line to the Southport to, to Wigan line or to create a walking line between the two. Um, a station to serve um, the prisons at Wymott and Garth. The reopening of Midge Hall. Um, I'm just jumping to paragraph 16 because obviously that's in existence. However, it's not been a stopping point since 1961. Um, and then also, it also looked at new station at Parker Lane, New Longton. And this would provide a new station to residents around the A582 tank roundabout linking Penwitham and West Leyland, um, which are all po poorly served by rail. And then also Coote Lane new station, um, both those and the Park Lane and New Longton would also um, require investment through um, new housing. Um, the report also looked at Coppel Station um, with three potential locations considered. Um, this station would require significant work um, with requirements to improve the West Coast Main Line and therefore has previously been ruled out. Um, it is a costly option. However, um, Coppel alone won't support it, but um, if there are investment from HS2 or if it is not provided by the, the rail industry, there is justification for development could come through from demand for higher passenger numbers from areas such as Charnock and Standish. Um, the two op the options were to look at um, a site to the north of Coppel, um, the original station location, and also a southern uh, location to the south of Coppel off Ch Chapel Lane. And that um, option C was considered to be the most feasible station option of the three presented. Um, if I now go back to the uh, paragraph 14, the tram train options, these were also considered towards Preston and a number of options were 
put forward for creating an improved Lancashire network. Um, three options were put forward. Um, obviously, tram trains are able to, able to leave the railway line, alignment and run along the streets, and that opens up potentials for routes which trains alone cannot reach. So option 3A was to use the existing rail um, um, and would need to align with the existing network and would offer for sort of a new station around Penrithen um, using the line approaching Preston from the southwest alongside the Golden Way. And then you would have a new service line um, between Longton and Penwitham Way to serve Penwitham and approach the city centre. <clears throat> and then another station, sorry, another route between Lockstock Hall and Avonham. And this would be rebuilding the old cord near Coote Lane and Farrington Own Line, Old Line, from the east of Lockstock Hall to Avonham. And that would also serve existing and new development in that area. So, the study concludes its findings with a RAG analysis and shortlisted the options presented and these were identified as Bursco Bridge unconnected extension, which would be an extension of the Merseyside, service, Merseyside rail services from Ormskirk to a new platform east of the A59 at Bursco Bridge, and that would rely on either electrification or use of a new rolling stock on hybrid power. A new station um, reopening at Midge Hall, and this would service existing and planned developments in the area, uh, as they would be required um, to cover the costs of redeveloping that. And also a new station around the Parker Lane, Longton, New Longton, Coote Lane area, uh, again dependent on housing numbers built in that area to justify passenger numbers. Copple Station as part of the RAG analysis was considered as a medium term option um, and there would need to be more evidence for the necessary wider growth in the area. Um, also the tram train option to improve services officer offered between Bursco and Preston was also presented as a medium term option um, and this did perform well in the RAG analysis um, for improvements close to Preston around New Longton and Penwitham. Um, following the study, which um, obviously is a snapshot in time and is a basis to do more work on, uh, the study has been shared with Lancashire County Council, our colleagues, the planning and transport port colleagues, um, who are working on the transport master plan. Um, and we will be having further discussions with them on the options. Um, as a note also, the MP for West Lancashire is also engaged in supporting developments to improve connectivity in Bursco and is raising the profile of that option. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Another comprehensive report and I think some of that's quite interesting and lots of people take different things out of it, depending on what they've been most interested in. If we've got any particular questions or comments or queries on that report, for this committee. Councillor Michael Green. Thanks Chairman. Um, I, I welcome the report um, uh, and the subject it's covering uh, and agree with the conclusions. Um, my, my only concern is, is I don't think this real study is actually taking us much further than where we already were um, because we already knew uh, most of these issues, but but it, it is helpful in terms of it reaffirming uh, the County Council's position on, on a lot of these. Um, I would agree with, with the work around Bursco, and I think that's one that should be taken forward. would also agree on, on mid Joel, which is actually, it's actually in my area. So it's something that I've personally been pushing for many years, um, but the real game changer is the development adjacent uh, to that site, which has got consent and is now starting to be to be built. Um, so these are these are things that we've been working on at the County Council and, and we'll continue to do so and I'm sure we'll, we'll be able to respond to this report in, in due course. Um, as for the other options of stations in the South Ibble area, I think, I think of the ones that have been mentioned, Coot Lane is probably the most appropriate uh, because again it's adjacent to potentially what is a very large development um, known as the Lanes now which formerly was known as Pickering's Farm. So as and when that comes forward, um, that will be a, a wonderful place for a station 
uh, to avoid people having to use uh, cars uh, and give them a viable green option um, to use in the future. With, with regard to the discussions on, on the comments in the report about Coppel, um, I, I know there's there's a demand um, from, from the local area for, for a station there, which is one which in principle I, I would be supportive of, um, but it's, it's just the feasibility obviously with it being stationed on, on the West Coast mainline. Uh, there are massive issues, but as and when they, those issues can be addressed in terms of there being additional capacity, that will be one that can be looked at at some point in the future. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll leave my comments there, there for, for now, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, Chris Blackburn, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, it's just to point out, really, that obviously this, this, this initial study uh, was looking at West Langs, Chorley and South Ribble, uh, and whilst, as Alison has gone through, there was various options looked at in terms of connectivity north towards Preston as well. Um, but I think <clears throat> it's 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 clear that I think there is a wider piece of work that we need to look at in terms of connectivity to Preston. Um, we are certainly mindful of that as officers in Preston, uh, and we are talking uh, with, with people about that, uh, including WSP. Uh, there's obviously changes of foot in terms of Preston Railway Station in the years to come in terms of HS2, but um, in terms of the, the, the developments that may well uh, come forward in South Ribble uh, within commuting distance of the city centre, um, it, it, I think it's, it's clearly critical. We need to look uh, at the connectivity between those sites and Preston City Centre, which is is a place where obviously many people go to work uh, and if we really are going to achieve uh, uh, or look to achieve a local plan that has sites on carbon neutrality um, you know we, we have to alongside the dueling of, of the A52 we really need to look at other uh, vehicular and public transport options for people to get into the city centre um, so it is something that we are mindful of uh, as officers at Preston that this study doesn't doesn't really go uh, much further than South Ribble, uh, and, and we, we we are keen to uh, to engage with uh, county and consultants uh, accordingly to try and uh, look at what we can do to uh, to furnish a little bit more detail on this. Thanks, Chair. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, Marcus Hudson, get your hand up. Thanks, Chair. Um, I, I just thought I'd come in very quickly, uh, just to I think echo Michael's. Uh, thought uh, this, this is a useful composite of, of, of studies and a useful update to those studies. Um, uh, and, and, and certainly, you know, it, it's uh, it's uh, it's information that needs to feed into the uh, the Highway and Transport Master Plan refresh, uh, as well as the local plan. And there's an important point there in terms of, uh, I think, you know, what Alison was alluding to in terms of transport led thinking uh, around a lot of this, uh, that this doesn't come this doesn't come forward and, and, and get delivered uh, all on its own. Um, and notwithstanding whether whether or not we can we can attract government money uh, into the area uh, to support some of these, there will still be a, a sizable local contribution that will be expected uh, to, uh, to sit alongside any government funding. Uh, and more often than not now, the only place we can look to that uh, is, is developer contributions. Um, so it's it, 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 I suppose it, it's where we've been for for a, for a good while now in terms of how we've approached uh, so, uh, some of our master planning. I, I have to I have to say the current Central Lancashire Highways and Transport Master Plan was very much development led in in, in its uh, uh, in its uh, in its thinking uh, and its outputs. Uh, we pretty much were presented with the problem and we had to try and find the transport solutions. Um, and we, we've done very well to get where we get to where we are now. Um, but this really offers us that opportunity to, to think um, broader than that and actually think from a transport led point of view, um, where is where, where development uh, should be led, uh, which should be located uh, in order that we can we can make best effect, if you like, to uh, to support uh, proposals such as this. And just finally, just just uh, just to point out the um, the, the the point that, that, that Chris was um, impressing upon us is to a, a large extent, I'd, I'd suggest, picked up in the, the Preston City Transport Plan. Um, I often think that the, the title is, is perhaps a little bit unfortunate because every everybody does think, well, it must be just to do with the, the, uh, 
the, the Preston City cordon then, but it, it doesn't, it thinks much wider than that. Um, interestingly enough, Kevin Riley, who, who produced the rail study, um, was um, was one of the consultants on the on the Preston City Transport Plan. And, and those wider sub, sub-regional um, links around mass transit, uh, trams have been mentioned and such like, as well as the wider local rail network are, are picked up within that Preston City Transport Plan. So, so just a plea there, don't, don't, don't forget that uh, and, and don't think it's simply um, fixated uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on the city centre alone. Uh, it does think strategically and, 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 and looks uh, to a much wider sub-regional area uh, in terms of transport solutions. I'll leave okay. it there. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Marcus. Okay. Um, Mem, those people who got their hands up, could you take them down if you've not, if you've asked your question and you're not wanting to say anything else? Because I don't think I've got anybody else who's new, um, who's not already asked something. Okay. Does that conclude the comments on that report? Uh, we're asked to note that report and no doubt we'll discuss um, some of the implications of it in due course. Um, the next report actually is yours report, Marcus. It's the um, City Deal update report. So I think you're you provided an update on that on a to follow paper which uh, members should have. Is there anything you wanted to raise on that, Marcus, in, in over and above the actual what's in the report? Or do you want to make any comments on any particular parts of that? Uh, um, just just very, very briefly, if I can, Chair, just to just you know, to give it some some sort of introduction. Um, th this is this is now. Um, I think I've said this before, but this is now the standard monitoring um, that, uh, that format uh, that we uh, that present in in, in, the, in the city deal uh, to the city deal governance. Um, and so, hopefully, we can get into a, a regular cycle of, of sharing it with uh, uh, the members of this committee as well. Um, so we have there um, four sections. Um, to that um, current city deal projects, uh, which it leads on, uh, and at the top of that, Preston Western Distributor. Um, I'll just say some very quick words about that. Um, I think I think the scale uh, and importance uh, warrants that. Um, and, and really to say that, uh, not, notwithstanding um, the, um, uh, the not, notwithstanding what we faced uh, over the last six seven uh, months or so. Um, Work has has actually progressed uh, very well, uh, very effectively. It's re required some creative uh, thinking and some creative work, creative working practices at times. Um, but really, in all, um, over over spring, uh, well, late winter, late winter months into into spring and um, and, and summer, um, we hadn't uh, we hadn't lost uh, uh, any time at all, really, on on program. Uh, unfortunately, then we've Become, we come to unseasonal levels of rainfall, uh, nothing to do with the pandemic, um, and, and that has challenged us. There are a lot of structures that we're dealing with um, along there, um, and, uh, and, and that unseasonal weather has uh, impacted on, on progress of several of those, uh, and we're now looking at ways that we can, uh, we can catch up um, on, 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 on that programme. But overall, uh, everything uh, everything has continued uh, at a at a very fair pace uh, on the the western distributor um in terms of other notables on that first page cotton parkway uh, we've just been talking about rail uh, and cotton parkway station um is is a project that is now uh, fully and firmly up and running and fully f funded um this is a new parkway station in northwest preston that uh, will um, um uh, provide for uh, the, the housing in that area, but also perform a, a wider sub-regional role, uh, acting as a partway station to intercept um, uh, traffic movements, um, the journeys uh, into Preston, uh, both for those working in Preston or, or working further afield. Um, and, uh, so that project is underway and uh, we have some challenging timescales of, of March 2023. Uh, in which to certainly spend the government's money, uh, which has come through the Transforming Cities Fund. Um, I think that's that's everything on that that first page. Um, just moving very quickly to page two. Uh, these are projects uh, that have uh, got underway, um, but uh, don't have a full funded position at, at this stage. Uh, they may be awaiting government funding. They may be away, uh, awaiting commitments uh, on local funding. 
Um, and included within that is the A582 dueling that we've just been talking about, um, or there's been mention of, um, and that is proceeding at, at some pace, uh, planning application determination um, very shortly. Uh, we're hopeful uh, before Christmas, but if not, immediately after. Um, land assembly and, and, and various other funding business case work um, is proceeding at pace as well, along with the design work. Um, I think I'll, I, unless there are any questions, I'll, I'll leave it there. Uh, it does go on. Uh, it talks about pipeline projects and within that, um, there's a lot of uh, the education provision that um, that we have talked about with with uh, with colleagues in districts and, and we have started to plan for um, and, and secure uh, contributions of land or or, uh, or funding towards, um, but those sit within a, a next stage, if you like, in, in terms of uh, delivery. And then the final page simply picks up on, on some of the completed projects. Those that, that, that um, specifically those that still have money uh, funding implications. So really the, uh, the the two large bypass schemes, which um, still have land and, and compensation uh, matters, uh, but but are up now operating, um, and, a, and an improvement scheme in in the village of Broughton as well. That uh, um, that is pretty much there in terms of uh, ongoing uh, site supervision uh, fees. So so that's hopefully that was it in a nutshell. Yeah, um, happy to take questions. No, that was great. Thank you, Marcus. Very, very helpful. Um, anybody got any points or questions or comments they want to make on any of that or any of the schemes on the report? No, I've got nobody. Um, speak up now. Got away lightly there, Marcus. Uh, <laughs> I think that's the that's the that's the crisis ever known it for a, a city deal know. report. But well, well done, <laughs> met the most of it, and uh, <laughs> we put it there to experience. Yeah, very good. Right. So if that's okay, then we'll move on to item ten, which is uh, the education update, which I think is being done by Alison. And have we got um, two county officers? Alison, is it Lynn and Mel? Um, yeah, we've actually got a presentation to share on the screen with you, if that's OK, which might just help with some of the, the thinking. That's brilliant. Fire away, yeah, if you can make it work. <sighs> that's the next oh, test. I, uh, <laughs> yeah, I think my, 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 uh, my, it's telling me my browser won't allow me to do that, which is a bit frustrating. We're not fully on Teams yet at County. Right. If you okay. can email it to myself, Carolyn Williams, I can share it for you and fast forward to the slides. Happy to do that. OK, bear with me one sec. We, we did uh, we did look at this and I've not had this problem previously. Two seconds. Should be winging its way. Is that coming to Carolyn? Was it? Sorry. It's, yeah, Carolyn Williams. It's not of me yet, but I'm hoping it will be of me in a minute. So we could go to the next item, but the next item is in a, a part two paper, so we'd have to probably struggle to come back to it. But uh, we'll give it a second or two if that's really okay with that. Apologies, Carolyn. I'm just trying to find your email. It's okay. Don't worry. It's Carolyn Williams. If you can't, what is? If you got, um, is, I think Dan. Is, he, is it easy for you to do it, Dan? I don't know as our IT person for the evening. <laughs> or Nina, if you've got Nina's. Uh, can have a look. Oh, the person who's the organizer. 
Yep, Nina, can I send it to you? I've got yours. Yep. There you go. It's on its way to Nina. Yeah, that's not a problem. I can do that. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. Apologies for that. C can you share that, Nina, when it comes, or are you going to forward it to Carolyn, which is the best way of doing this? Yeah, I can share it. I can do that. Okay. Yep. Right. Thank you. Fab, we love technology. We'll get, we'll get there. Yeah. Collective, effort, collective effort. Best um, demonstration of joint working. Absolutely. Bring it on. <laughs> Okay. Shall I start talking whilst it's uh, coming up on screen? Because I'm conscious that I will do, Mel. Yeah. yeah. Carry okay. On. So what we're going to just run you through, I guess, is is a little bit of a, a whistle stop tour of, of how we do things, which I thought might help to explain kind of how we approach it. And we'll obviously talk you through the numbers that we've got in each of the areas uh, where we can see the hotspots and uh, what we're trying to do about those. So obviously. Um, uh, Lancashire County is the, the education authority. We've got that duty to be providing a Lancashire place for every Lancashire child that wants one. Uh, it's very much a collaborative effort with all of the maintained schools across the county um, and obviously within Chorley, South Ribble and Preston. Um, just awareness that we do have a mixed economy of schools um, across the county, as, as is the national position, free schools, academies, dioceses, voluntary aided, voluntary control foundations, and, and many of those um, determine their own admission arrangements, which does um, uh, in, in, it, it does uh, add another dimension, if you like, to where we're trying to bring forward additional places. Um, we bring those forward where there's evidence of sustained need, uh, being very mindful of, of, of that balance of uh, school places across across each district um, and, and, and being mindful not to oversupply places ahead of when they're needed, which then can destabilise some of the uh, less popular schools in an area. So there's a balancing trick there to be had. It's all captured within the um, uh, school place provision strategy, the new one of which is, is, is due um, in early in the new year. And that does then talk much more in detail around how we, we how when uh, we bring forward new places and uh, where they're required and, and, and where we can add capacity to the portfolio. And it is a combination of existing the schools that we've got as well as bringing forward new schools when that's the right thing to do so. Uh, um, Mel, you're, you're on the slides now, so are you on great, the fantastic. slides? So which, I'm which on page slide do you three now. If we can pick up that one, that will be wonderful. Pick up on slide three, and if you want to just say next slide, then Nina will take you on. So oh, click, okay. click on slide three, Nina, please. Thanks, Nina. Hopefully they've all got a bigger screen than me as well. Okay, so it's the one that's headed school planning approach, if we can go to that one. Brilliant. OK, so uh, we talked about it being an evidence based forecast of school place requirements. So that takes a combination of the pupil census, which is carried out um, um, twice a year, in year migration and then the housing land supply data that comes from districts. So we, re we refresh that, uh, that review twice a year. We have to produce an annual return into the Department for Education via something that's called the School Capacity Survey or the SCAP, which is a bit easier to say. And that sets out our place provision, our forecast, what those um, parental preferences are and the cost of providing those additional places. This then is reflected in a, in a scorecard with the DfE, uh, where obviously in each of those criteria, it's a compare and contrast across other LAs and, and, and across the county, Lancashire performs well in terms of, of, of those aspects. It's fair to say that within, within the county, obviously there will be the variations and there'll be hotspots, um, surpluses and, and so forth um, across that. Um, we do take account um, planning across the district borders, so um, um, obviously parents and, and applications to school don't necessarily see some of the administrative boundaries that we would see. Um, and also, as I said earlier, about that viability of the existing schools to make sure that we bring forward the numbers when and as is, is most appropriate. And also taking into account where we've got that cross border of, of, of pupils uh, taking up places in Lancashire and vice versa. Um, geographic priority areas, that is, if you like, um, for, for some of our schools, they have, a, um, uh, if you like, a geographic area that then uh, you might know as, as a catchment area um, for those. And we do review those with the schools in the areas where, where appropriate uh, to look if the, we can build some more flexibility into where preferences come. I'll just hand across to, to, to Lynn, who will just talk you through what the, the numbers are. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks, Mel. Can I just check just everything? Just on the slides. That, yeah, the slides aren't moving on. No, they're so not. Can you try again? Could we go to slide four, please? Can you click on it, Nina, please? Hiya, sorry, I'm just trying it. On my screen, it's showing slide four. Um, so I've just got IT with me here now. I'm just trying to work out the right one.
brilliant working. I Thank can see you. it anyway. Thanks, Nina. Um, so if I can just pick up, from, thanks for that, Mel, um, pick up on the more specific numbers in the areas. So as you can see on this slide here, we're, we're looking at the primary schools. So we've got 143 primary schools across the three areas. Um, we, we plan for places in what are known as school planning areas, and they're just smaller areas within um, within the districts for, for primaries. We, we plan secondary places on a district basis, but on primaries we have planning areas that the DfE insists that we have, but it also reflects the travel to school routes so that we're looking at smaller areas within those districts and we've got um, you know a small number in each of the districts of those. In terms of the numbers of schools, whilst we've got 143, in the next column you can see we've got a really high proportion of schools that are their own admission authority. So that includes the um, academies and free schools, but it also includes schools that are voluntary aided, so the faith schools. So over half of our schools across the area are responsible for their own admission arrangements and that includes the criteria under which they admit children and that's particularly um, a, 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 an issue in some areas where the numbers start to rise and you'll get a, a high um, number of faith schools for example that have church attendance as the criteria for admission and you can see that if you're talking about half of your schools who've got that kind of criteria the chances of getting into the schools that you want reduce as the numbers go up. The next column shows you the capacity in all our schools in each of the areas. Then we've got a figure on roll, the number of children that were on roll at the last pupil census last January um, in comparison to that uh, capacity. So you can see in each of the areas at the moment we have got places We've got um, over 400 surplus places in the Preston Primary Schools, 500 in South Ribble and over 600 in Chorley. If we move forward to the five year forecast, so that takes into account the live birth rates coming through, in year migration and transfers within um, schools and also the housing impact. And it's only the housing impact has taken in the housing land supply for the five year position. What you start to see is some shortfalls emerging in Preston. So you can start to see that you actually have a shortfall of 45 places net in Preston within the next five years. The other two areas at the moment on the net figures are showing a downward trajectory because the birth rates have actually fallen in those areas. But can I stress and hence the footnote at the bottom that although that represents a net position, there will still be hotspots within those districts. So they could and they even straddle districts often. It could be there's um, the catchment of a development on the border of two districts, for example, that could emerge as a shortfall, even though the net bottom line is showing sufficient places but the first area is a net shortfall is showing as Preston and that reflects the, the amount of housing plan going forward. Um, next slide please Nina. So on the secondaries, um, again, the, the underlying issue is that the birth rates that were falling in the primary schools, so we've seen a, a fall in the birth rates in some areas, the higher numbers that we've been dealing with in primary schools over the last few years have now started to move into the secondary sector. So the numbers in secondary schools nationally and in this area are rising. That's given us more of an issue because we've got less schools to actually go and approach um, for additional places. You've got much smaller numbers here in comparison to the 143 primaries, you're dealing with 27 secondary schools. Then if you look at the next two columns, we've got a significant, significantly higher number of academies and free schools who are completely um, independent of the authority. But in terms of own admission authority schools, we've got a massive increase in comparison to the primary sector, with Chorley having 100% of all the schools are responsible for their own admission arrangements. So their, admis their admission criteria um, and the number of places that they're admitting year on year which really, really reduces the amount of influence that we can have. Going forward again, we've got a current capacity figure there and comparing that with the actual number on roll, as you can see, we have got places in every three and every one of the three areas, um, even though it's being picked up for by some parents and you were reflecting earlier in your local plan feedback that there is perhaps some dissatisfaction there. Um, there is a net overall um, sufficient places. That changes as we go forward five years and we do start to see some shortfalls emerging in both Preston and in Chorley, but that's at the same time that we've still got significant surplus in South Ribble. So we need to take a bit more of um, 
a holistic approach to planning secondary places because we do know children will travel across borders to access good and outstanding schools and that is something that we just need to monitor and closely work with our pupil access colleagues on in terms of travel to school routes and looking at gpas but overall the position although it's getting um we're having less places in five years there still are a net 704 spur places in for in five years time so i come back to saying that's only using the housing information in your housing land supply at the moment so anything on top of that that we're looking forward in terms of the local plan obviously we'll will be um, will be on top of that um, and i think it reflects the situation that as the numbers rise in secondary parents are more vocal parents are more willing to travel to outstanding and good schools and unfortunately market forces mean that as numbers start to rise less children will get their first preference although if we look at it nationally and coming back to what mel said in comparison to the dfe scorecard our level of success in getting parents one of their um, preference schools, there are three preferences of schools. In secondary, we're comparing at 95.9% in comparison to England's 93.8. And in primary, it's 97.9 in comparison to England's 97.7. Okay, thank you. Next slide, please. OK, um, so in terms of the funding, then, for how we bring those additional places um, forward. So uh, one one funding stream is uh, the Department for Education's basic need grant, and that's allocated um, annually against the SCAP return, that that, that data return that we, um, we, we, we make back to the Department for Education each year. And that's a proportion of the overall pot for England. And they do take into account the cost of places um, uh, when they are allocating that. Um, more importantly, I guess, for the purposes of, of, of this meeting is, is Section 106 and community infrastructure levy funding from developers. And then there is a there, there's a margin of school contributions, which is um, predominantly for um, fixtures and fittings, really those things that make a school a school once you've, you've put the walls and, and everything in place. Um, next slide, please. Um, what I should also add to that really is there is, uh, in terms of basic need, obviously with the, uh, the, the pushback on the national spending review, uh, increasingly uh, waiting to understand what that is going to look like going forwards. Um, what we do do uh, in terms of um, um, trying to secure developer contributions for education is, is, is based on the Department for Education guidance. Um, you can see there there's a, there's a, there is a link to um, our local methodology, which is based um, on that guidance and reflects the expectations of the Department for Education. Um, where where basic need grant obviously is is there available but this this should not um, be there to negate the responsibility and the duty on on housing developers to mitigate the impact of their development on education um, in short they're expected to be um, meeting the the education requirements really in terms of that that pressure that the uh, the new housing land supply is 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 placing on local infrastructure and and again that's that's something that we're, we're very keen to continue to work with um, with the local planning authorities in being able to secure. Um, next slide, please. In terms of what we've provided so far, you can see there um, across the three areas uh, that the first column sets out the number of places that have been provided at, at primary and at secondary level in each of the three districts. You can see there the, the level of contributions that have funded these places from basic need and the percentage then of, of the total expenditure and then the developer contributions that have been um, secured and then applied to those projects. And as you can see, whilst we've got a lot of development in the central Lancashire area, um, that in terms of the developer contributions, that funding isn't coming forward into meeting the, uh, the cost of that infrastructure. And then also the third column there you can see, which is the school funding that's applied to that. Um, just to draw your attention there to obviously one of those those sites um, again it's that cross border issue so where we may have a development that's in one of the districts the funding may well then provide places in a, in a school which is nearby just across into the neighboring district which is the case there for the south of primary contributions next slide please um, and then you can see there a breakdown so obviously where where um, the developments are coming forward through the planning process um, the, the, the as education authority will make a request there to to secure contributions from the local planning authority. The 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 total of the pie, if you like, is is the ask that we've made of of, of each area, and the um the, the the portion of that which is uh, coloured in orange is the amount that we've been able to secure against those those contributions, as opposed to what we've we've, we've not been successful in in in. Uh, 
in, in drawing that contribution in from from the developers. So you can see there it's a it's it's a mixed picture across the central Lancashire area. Next slide, please. Lynn, do you want to pick up on the hotspot areas that we're looking at? Yeah, thanks, Mel. Um, so we have been delivering places, as Mel's just said, across the areas. And this is the position where we're looking going forward now, areas that are starting to emerge. So if we look at um, the Preston Primary, we've engaged with some primary heads and some secondary heads um, in 2018 across those areas to look at uh, places. In Preston Primary, we were poised to add some permanent places as part of our scoping last year. Uh, we have already added a bulge year at one of our primary schools to take care of a high cohort, but the birth rate in Preston Primaries in those areas dropped significantly uh, for two years consecutively. So we've just pressed the pause button for now, and we'll pick that up again in our scoping exercise after Christmas, because we will need to provide additional places there. The, the, all the indications are that we will need to as a result of all the housing development but that at the moment is being offset by the birth rate reduction in that area um, and then obviously the Goosner and Grimser area where we've got a site for a new school we're closely monitoring that current indications are that we might need to actually um, look at providing places in that area within five years but I, I must stress that the birth rate can turn around very quickly upwards and downwards so it is if it's on this list what it's showing is that we're monitoring it very closely rather than a guarantee of action being taken and what we'll do is we will be putting these hotspots within our strategy where we're updating that in the new year so we can uh, move that forward secondary we've put two bulge years in at Ashton um, high school for 2020 and 21 and now we'll start to scope for 22 and beyond and we will be looking at putting some places in across the area there um when we engaged with the secondary heads they were very very clear that they wanted to unlock existing capacity in schools first and foremost rather than building any new extensions or commissioning a new school so at the moment we're working with the existing schools to see how we can bring those places forward in the short term with an eye on additional places for the long term uh, south ribble just the primary sector where we've got an eye on rural south ribble where the numbers keep um they're quite close to what uh, number of places we have and then very closely looking at Leyland and Penwitham where we've got those significant housing sites attached to developments that's on a, a regular review um, when we might need those to come forward and then in Chorley there are, we've seemed to have dealt with the majority of those hotspots that were coming through in Chorley primary in terms of planning areas we are monitoring Exton because we know that's very tight, but it has been historically tight because it's got very popular schools, even though we've added significant numbers of places already in the Exton area. Um, but again, similar to Preston, the birth rate just dipped for a couple of years, which means that we press the pause button in Chorley and there's no immediate need. The more pressing need is for Chorley secondary places, um, and we're anticipating a need for about 400 places within five years in the secondary sector. However, that is a problem compounded by the fact that all of the schools in Chorley are their own admission authority so our influence is quite limited and at the same time you've got considerable surplus places in neighbouring areas. Thanks Mel. Okay next slide please. So just to run through then um, I guess some of the challenges really is is, is obviously well uh, I suppose it's, I know the, earlier on the agenda there was the item around the uh, the, the planning consultation whether that, uh, that any changes will come nationally to that um, naming projects to be still compliant. Um, we we're obviously cautious around naming projects um, far ahead of the need for places. Uh, there's a requirement on us as education authority to have a statutory consultation um, or agreement with the school depending on the scale of the expansion. Um, and obviously, um, between that time of, of, of forecasting a need, bringing that forward, uh, school standards can change and the leadership can change and their views on expansion can also change. So we, we're obviously working with quite a lead time um, ahead. Um, we have uh, uh, um, at times been asked to be providing uh, REBA stage two assessments um, for, for projects, um, which, is, which isn't feasible for us with the volume of, of, of assessments that we're running. Um, obviously, we do look at the spatial requirements for a site. Uh, we look at the, 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 the sort of early level uh, feasibility in terms of what might be possible to expand the school in terms of parental preferences, in terms of standards, as well as the size of the site and any constraints. Um, but obviously, uh, again, as we're working ahead of uh, formal consultations, very, very cautious around um, around that and obviously capacity to do so. And then obviously working as well within within the central Lancashire areas, 
We've got um, layers, if you like, of, of arrangements um, with City Deal as well in, within this footprint and different interpretations across um, across many areas around the SIL regulations. And so we would obviously, um, as, as you'd expect, encourage consistency of approach across Lancashire districts in terms of uh, that collaboration to bring forward education infrastructure and the funding for that. Um, just next slide, please. Just looking to the future, um, obviously the more information that we have, fantastic, that helps to inform the planning process. Um, just ask for some some um, uh, acknowledgement around around the challenges, I guess, that we have, particularly with the shifting educational environment, and 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 that working to ensure that developers are are, are um, mitigating the impact of their of, of their uh, housing development that comes forward. Um, looking for full involvement in master planning processes, which helps us to be able to assist that suitability of sites, and obviously that acknowledgement as well that areas can can shift. So. Um, Thank you for your time and, and, and obviously very happy to take any, any questions on that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, very interesting and fascinating information. Um, has anybody got any questions now or comments now? Um, and my, as well, just in advance of that, are we able to have a copy of those slides to take back? To yes, our, yes. Yeah, our organisations, because I suspect that, yeah, that's fine. it will um, further debate in something eventually. Um, on behalf of Charlie, I don't doubt elsewhere. Talking of which, Councillor Martin Boardman, are you going to ask a question about Charlie Martin or a wider question? Absolutely, Alistair, absolutely. Charlie, it's nothing for me. less. Go on, <laughs> play on. Wave the flag again. Um, thank you very much for the study. It's, it's very interesting reading. Um, I, I do think that there needs to be another layer added to this, um, and, I, and, I, and I'm, I'm speaking from the rural areas, I'm afraid, um, but rural Charlie, rural South Ribble. Um, we look at Chorley with a, a cluster of secondary schools, and I'm specifically looking at secondary schools. Um, <clears throat> when you look at the physical distance between those secondary schools, it's it's quite concerning when you live out in the rural areas. Um, as as those uh, guys will tell you, you know we we have one secondary school between the um, the let's should we say the, the southern western tip of Chorley Borough, which is uh, Maudsley, um, and um, and Parklands High School, which is the nearest one in Chorley. Um, we have a Bishop Rawstone, which is the one school. Um, I'm a bit concerned that the report doesn't actually look at the demographic of people and the distance they have to travel in order to obtain uh, education at one of the secondary schools, certainly within the Chorley area. And I just don't know if that's the level of information that you've got that you can add to it um, that was certainly beneficial to, um, uh, to discuss within our council, definitely. Anyone want to come back on that? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, um, I guess that, that the challenge with rural areas is obviously that 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 density of population, as you say, Bishop Rawstone is probably the the nearest um, geographically to the area. But obviously, as we said in the presentation, all of the schools in Chorley are own admission authorities and set their own criteria for for um, applications for places there. Um, in terms of um, um, the travel to learn, obviously, um, there's the, I guess there's implications there in terms of school travel and 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 where faith criteria and so forth comes in. But but um, in terms of sufficiency of places, as you can see, we, we do have those available, but notwithstanding some of the issues for, for access from the rural areas, we can certainly take away um, the, the, the query specifically around around travel patterns um, into those areas. Yeah, thank you. If you can, and the travel patterns. Uh, thanks, Alice. So just to come back, travel patterns need to also reflect travel availability. Um, you know, it's it's fine if you're on the outskirts of um, of Leyland Town, Chorley Town, Preston Town. You can use the travel network, buses, trains, um, even walk on foot. Uh, but you know, when you when you're relying on the uh, the bus of mum and dad, which um, uh, you know we we all use from time to time, and our, our kids do, um, it gets quite difficult when you've got to ferry them backwards and forwards to school when um, when there isn't actually any buses um, that that take kids that way. So um, I think it's one that needs to be looked at as part of the strategy, certainly. Yeah. And and I think probably can be overlaid on top of some of that core information that was in that report. And I think that's perhaps what to the guys we were referring to earlier on. This is a first or a, a higher level thing, which I think um, um, perhaps individual areas can look at as well in terms of travel to, to school, travel to education kind of distances, because that's some of the more yeah. nuanced um, and things. I've got Lynn and then Alistair Morwood, Lynn McDonald and then Alistair Morwood. So. Uh, thanks, Chair. I was just going to make a point about, um, you mentioned Parklands earlier about the need for places in um, in the more rural areas. We did actually approach Parklands when we were putting the additional places in at Southlands High School and 
Although they gave us early indication that they would be interested in expansion and providing additional places, unfortunately withdrew that later on down the process. So we have actually been engaging with some of those schools, but we can't force a school, which is its own admission authority, particularly academies, which we've got to actually expand. So the, the, we can influence the, the GPAs and the, the admission criteria, but at the end of the day, it's the difficulty of them being all their own admission authorities, unfortunately, as well which in Chorley is a particular problem because it's very, very high. So, yeah, I agree yeah. with that. OK, thank you, thank you for that. Uh, Alistair Morewood. So basically you're saying that in the next five years, we're going to need 400 more places in Chorley. But the schools are basically going to turn around and say, sorry, we're not happy to take any more students. We're pretty much full now. We don't want to expand more buildings. So what happens next you've got no influence on them so what do you do with those 400 that are going to uh, uh, suddenly want places because i um, suspect that they, and of course that will have to be an academy if it was a new school it would be an academy and they would have their own criteria for admissions and the whole thing just goes on and on but somewhere else now we have to say so what do you do <laughs> if you're going to create an education system alistair you wouldn't start like this would you uh, no, it certainly wasn't like that in my day. <laughs> okay. Hi. Shall, um, shall I come in on that one? Yeah, please yes, do. Yeah. Please. <laughs> yeah. um, in, in, in terms of school numbers, um, I think um, what I probably would say was that in terms of a new school at secondary level, you'd be looking at a minimum of 600 places to make it financially viable, if not if not greater than that. So um, in, in terms of the shortfall, obviously, we're not we're not looking at numbers in that way. Um, we would, of course, be working collaboratively with all of the schools in, in the local area. Whilst they're their own admissions authority, they are part of the Lancashire School family. And it is absolutely right and proper that we you know, continue to have that dialogue with them and focus in on that dialogue with them as the forecasting numbers are starting to show where, where the pressure is. So it will be a collaborative effort, a collaborative solution. And, and obviously, um, you know, we'd be looking at, at um, how we can work with those schools, where we think there might be opportunities to add capacity into the system there, but also being mindful as well of, of the position of schools, um, you know, surrounding Chorley and the capacity that's available in those. Because, as you know, those those most successful schools um, with, 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 with the outcomes that are particularly popular with parents, are the ones then where we see the pressure in terms of um, you know seeking additional numbers. So there's a number of things that play into there, but we will obviously be working very close with the schools in the area to uh, to bring forward the appropriate solution. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, thanks, thank you, Alistair. Um, I'm not. I don't think any other hands up unless somebody has. Um, I think this is very much a start for ten, and it's certainly something we've been asking for for a while, um, and it's been very helpful. And I think I don't know pre-book you're back here again at a future date but I think it might be worth taking this report back to the individual authorities and then coming back with a sort of secondary level of questions perhaps from the different organisations and then maybe putting a second session on or feeding that into further work because I think what we saw from that report was you're doing a number of watching briefs on a number of areas which like you said can change in due course so it might be that we need another visit on this when we've had a chance to digest this and also we've seen which way the world's moving um in the future if that's okay yeah uh, more, but, than, but, more than happy to come back yeah and if there's right. if there's other questions you want to send through to us that we can you know start to build up the kind of line of inquiry we're more than happy to do that that would be brilliant so thank you very much for that report um thank you members for your questions and if we can move on that would also get us completed at some a reasonable time tonight thank you. everybody happy with that great thank you Right, we're now moving to part two. So anybody who's done their reports and wishes to drop off this meeting, uh, we move to part two of the papers. I don't think we have to formally move it, but I think we have to stop videoing the meeting at this point um, from my chair's agenda.